Welcome to Healthline 3, I'm Terry Simmons. Today we're talking with Dr. Mark Callahan Jr. Callahan Jr. of the Orthopedic Clinic, the Willis Knight and Clinic Health System about shoulder and pain treatment. So we'll be taking your calls throughout the show and as a reminder, please make sure you're in a quiet room with your TV turned down low so we can hear your questions. The number to call is 318-219-4569 and you'll see it across the bottom of your screen throughout the show. Thank you, Dr. Callanan. Absolutely. We're really happy, happy to be here. To hear it. Thank yeah. you so much. Let's start off with showing what you've got for us. We're going to refer to that. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is my shoulder model, and this is one of the things I really like to use when people come in to see me in clinic. I think the shoulder joint itself is a fairly complex joint, so sometimes when you're throwing out all these terms to patients, having an actual 3D model they could see, they can touch, that we can put up an x-ray and I can correlate the x-ray or MRI findings directly to what they're seeing. Um, it just makes it a little bit better for patient understanding for a fairly, again, complex joint. Okay. And so we're going to be referring to this several times throughout mm -hmm. the show, but look, right now we were just talking before we went on, like, talk about rotator cuff. We hear yeah. that a lot. Oh, you, you, hear it, you think you know exactly what that is, but can you show us what that is Absolutely. On there? So the rotator cuff, and this is one of the biggest causes of shoulder pain, and everybody kind of knows the term rotator cuff. What it actually is, it's a collection of four muscles. They all attach to your shoulder blade over here. There's the subscapularis, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. You don't ever have to remember that. That, but just know there's four of them and they reach over and terminate kind of on the outside of the ball all right and what their job is to basically keep that ball centered on the socket any type of you know reaching grabbing pushing pulling that you're doing that cuff is fire and helping facilitate normal motions and movement patterns in the shoulder okay all right so what is the most common type or cause of shoulder pain actually yeah I would say when I see people in clinic you know again kind of touching back to what we talked about there's a large number of people that wake up one day, start having shoulder pain, there's no specific injury, they didn't fall, they didn't pick up anything heavy, and they just say, doc, my shoulder started hurting, getting worse over time. I would say the large majority of these patients have some degree of kind of rotator cuff inflammation or tendonitis. Um, you know, when people throw out the term shoulder bursitis, that's actually correlated to having a rotator cuff tendonitis. There's something called a bursa, which is a little fluid-filled sac that sits up above the tendons and allows for normal gliding. We have them around most tendon sites in the body. When that shoulder starts getting inflamed, that bursal sac gets thickened, it gets inflamed, there's a lot of nerve endings, and that's when people really start having pain. In particular, people reaching up overhead, behind their back, sleeping on that shoulder. Those are the most common causes, and I would say rotator cuff inflammation is kind of at the top of that list when people come in for pain. Okay, and is that what the pain actually is? It's inflammation pushing on nerves? and Exactly. It's okay. inflammation inside the shoulder. Right. Now, certainly you can have structural things where you actually have a partial thickness or a full thickness tear in the rotator cuff, and again, when you start altering the mechanics of the shoulder, it's more the inflammation going on in the shoulder as a response to having this underlying pathology or these underlying conditions in the shoulder that causes the pain. Okay. I will also say one of the most common kind of referral patterns, the way we're wired in the body, is people won't necessarily feel it directly in the shoulder, they'll feel it down the side of the arm. So a lot of times people are confused, they come and they say, Doc, it's not my shoulder, I feel it down on the side of my arm. The way we're wired, the classic referral pattern is down the lateral side. So this is pretty common when people start having you know, problems inside the shoulder, shoulder, rotator cuff or otherwise. Oh, that is so interesting. I want to talk to you more about that too mm -hmm. because it is a really interesting thing to think of that we don't think about when we realize we go up to the shoulder. That's really the cause of the pain. Here. Absolutely. We have someone named Steve on the line for you. Steve, right. what is your question for the doctor? A couple of questions. Um, I have was told I had tendonitis in my left shoulder. They didn't really explain what it was. They just told me I had it. And then they didn't tell me what were the best exercises, you know, for my shoulder. And I had a nurse tell me one time in the hospital that they worry about their shoulders more than anything because they lift and stuff a lot, patient. And uh, they said that you have a lot of nerves in your shoulder. Yeah. And so, so I just wanted to ask you about it. You know, what, what are the best, like I use an exercise arm bike at the fitness place. And uh, I'm assuming that's good for it. You know, I don't know. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's one of the most common questions I have is, okay, what can I do on my own for kind of preventative things? Um, to get kind of on the two points of your question, when you're talking about nurses in the hospital, absolutely. When they're moving patients, they're doing repetitive things. Anybody that has a job that's physically demanding, construction workers, mm -hmm. people doing stuff on a line or otherwise, repetitive shoulder motions typically can cause inflammation of that cuff. So, you know, to your point about different exercise, I think the shoulder, you know, bike is one of the things the therapist will put you through, and I think that's great for kind of activating the shoulder, keeping things moving. You know, if you look um, at different exercises like YTLs or look at rubber band pull-aparts, there's some very simple things that I think 
you can find in, you know, I always reference patients to YouTube even. You know, I have my own set of exercises I can give you in clinic, but certainly there's a wealth of information online. But I think what I typically tell yeah. people are scapular wall slides, band pull-aparts, and YTLs. And look those three up, and those are kind of a good start for most people. It's something that you're basically activating that cuff in different patterns. It helps work on shoulder mechanics and posture, and those are kind of the big things that are stuff you can do on your own to help mitigate shoulder pain. Okay. So would you say... Does that answer your question, Steve? Do you have another question? It does. Thank you. And I want to thank you. You're, you're one of my favorite morning people. <laughs> your smile is... You always seem so happy, and I enjoy it. Oh, well, thank but you I want to ask much. him, would that be the most proactive yeah. stance that I could take is exercise? Yeah, I would say exercise. And, and again, you'll find... What I typically tell people too with a history of shoulder pain, if you're going back into the gym and you're doing weight training, try to keep a two to one ratio mm -hmm. of pulling exercises versus pressing exercises. A lot of people want to go in, they want to do shoulder exercises, chest exercises, mm -hmm. and they neglect kind of the upper trap, the upper back, and kind of more pulling exercises, which I think helps balance out mm -hmm. the shoulder and the rotator cuff. Okay. And again, those exercises I told you are good to do on a daily basis or as a warm up if you were to get into the weight room. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much awesome. for calling. Hope that answered your question. Thank we you. appreciate it. That's Thanks for very watching. very helpful. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks thank you. Time. And I think we have Michelle on the line. Michelle, what is your question for the doctor? Okay. Michelle? Is Michelle there? Okay. All right, well, I want to ask you some more. Yeah. I'm sure, Michelle, maybe she'll call back in a oh. second. But in, in, until then, mm -hmm. you talked about those exercises, and yes. we can look them up on YouTube. Are those some things to do preventative, or is that if you already feel stiff or pain? Can we also do those? Are those also good to keep us healthy that, before there's something Absolutely, wrong? and I think that's a great question. I think a lot of them, you can use them for both. You know, mm -hmm. when you look at the exercises that I have on my shoulder routine, it's nothing, you know, rocket science. It's just very focused on the rotator cuff, making sure you're, you know, working on posture, mechanics, and strengthening kind of all aspects of the cuff. So certainly does work when people have acute shoulder pain, but it's also very good for preventative. And I think a lot of times most, pretty much everybody could benefit from even a quick warm up of that rotator cuff prior to getting in any type of weight training in particular. Right, and it's important if you're gonna do these exercises, if you're gonna do a push, do a pull too. To yeah, absolutely, good keep it balance. balanced, <laughs> keep it balanced. And again, the two to one ratio is just something I recommend because I think some people get too focused on pressing movements in the gym. They're typically more fun to do, and so that's why people hone in, especially you know my, my male patients, they love that. And uh, it's one of those things where you really gotta focus on keeping balance, because I think sometimes imbalances in the shoulder is one of the reasons why people have pain. And that's why I rely heavily on our great physical therapists that we have, and you know, uh, they really help work on things from the mechanic standpoint, the posture standpoint, because our goal is not just to get you out of the acute shoulder pain, it's to help prevent things moving forward. And that's where, really where some of these exercises in the therapy have a pretty important role. Which is a really good point about your physical therapist, because sometimes we can do these shoulder exercises, and if you're not really focused on feeling it in the shoulder while you're doing it, exactly. it might not be really what you're trying to target. So that's what they can help you with your form. A hundred percent. And you know, I have guys of all, you know, guys and gals of all skill levels, all walks of life, you know, athletes, weekend warriors, people just wanting to play with their grandchildren on the weekends. Um, everybody I feel can benefit from physical therapy to some degree. So I think that's one of the biggest misnomers too, is when you come in, they, you know, you think it's just gonna be putting you through rote exercises, everybody gets the same cookie cutter thing, and that's not the case. You know, they're no. really focused with a good therapist on, you know, really balancing out any weaknesses that you have and showing you proper technique to help prevent things. You know, we can throw medications and anti-inflammatories and injections at a shoulder, but at the end of the day, unless we correct the underlying issue, you know, we don't want this to keep being a recurrent thing. Right. Good to know. Good practice. And so there is a difference in pain shoulder and stiffness. And we mm -hmm. talked to something that I didn't realize, that it doesn't have to be an injury or moving a different way or sleeping no. wrong. You could have a, a condition like thyroid or something mm -hmm. going on in your body that yep. can settle in your shoulder and make it stiff, right? Absolutely. So some people are just predisposed. I don't want to say it's just bad luck, but in a way it kind of is. Mm -hmm. um, certainly diabetes has been tied to this. There is some evidence of hypothyroidism. If you have these underlying what we call metabolic uh, conditions, uh, certainly you may have a higher chance of getting insidious onset or you know no trauma no known event 
of stiffness and pain in the shoulder. And when people talk about frozen shoulder, there's multiple causes of it. Certainly you could have a trauma, inflammation in that shoulder, and you know, certainly when the shoulder hurts, you don't wanna move it in specific positions. So over time, when you don't move in those positions, that joint's gonna contract down a little bit, and that's how some people will develop it. Now again, outside of trauma, I've had a lot of patients that have diabetes at baseline, they wake up one day, their shoulder is not only painful, but they can't move it. They feel like they're hitting a wall in different conditions. And again, when you're talking about capsulitis, the capsule of the shoulder is essentially the soft tissues and ligaments that kind of separate a joint out from the surrounding soft tissues in the body. So your knee, your hip, you know, your shoulder, everything has a capsule around it. That capsule is usually nice and pliable. And you know, again, you can get into pretty complex kind of biochemistry and reasons why people with diabetes or otherwise can have thickening and you know basically contracture that capsule but on a nutshell you basically take a nice pliable spongy tissue that allows you to move normal shoulder patterns contract it down make it almost stiff inflamed painful and that's what a frozen shoulder essentially is right and you don't have to live with that sometimes we just think oh I've just got a bad shoulder yeah come to see you absolutely you know there's different <laughs> treatments and again when we're talking about treatments for the shoulder, I think you know one of the biggest fears patients have when they see me is they say orthopedic surgery and they focus too much on the surgery aspect right. of things. They think that I'm gonna shake their hand and sign them up for surgery in the next second, which is not the case. You know, my goal with any patient or anybody that comes through the door is one, to evaluate you, make sure you understand your condition, and two, try to get you better without cutting on you. And those are the two goals, I think, of any good surgeon. Um, certainly, you know, there's a lot of conservative stuff. We kind of touched on the therapy, I think is very important, especially in my practice. The large majority of my patients, especially the first time I see you, are gonna get some form of therapy if your condition warrants it. Um, injections, anti-inflammatory, some of these other things. There's a lot of kind of what I call tools in the toolbox. And again, depending on the severity of your condition and how aggressive you wanna be, you don't have to pull out every tool in the toolbox when you come in to see me. We can kind of work with things and, you know, given your desire of more or less, we can kind of go forward with these things. And that's what I love when we are talking to you too, that even though you're a surgeon, that, that's really the last thing you really want to have to do. There's so much more that a surgeon, Absolutely. especially with your type and all the training and everything that you know, let's try everything first. And Absolutely. Then, then if you need surgery, I'm Absolutely. your guy. I'm, Absolutely. I'll do that, I know. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and I think that's the most important thing. Now certainly some patients will come in, they've already seen somebody, they've already had a workup, they come in with a large cuff tear or something that's already been treated, and they're looking for surgery. And there's certain indications where if I, feel we can't get you better and it's not worth your time and this is something we need to fix, I'm gonna let you know, mm -hmm. you know? But certainly, again, to your point, you know, anytime I can get you better without cutting on you, that's my primary goal. Which is very comforting and good to know. And you can ask all the questions. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. So if someone is sitting at home, they're watching, they have a little stiffness or shoulders or shoulder pain, and do they go to their doctor first and then refer to you? Or mm -hmm. how does that work if they think, or if they have gone to their doctor, Yeah. how do I, they get to you? I think it happens either way. That's one of the other questions too. When is it time to go from my primary mm -hmm. care physician to an orthopedic surgeon? You know, if you've had one or two weeks of shoulder pain and you've never had any history of it, there's no big trauma or anything like that, you know, certainly you don't have to come right to an orthopedic surgeon. There's a lot of great primary care physicians that can, you know, diagnose you, get you basic x-rays, do injections, anti-inflammatories, therapy. There's a lot of conservative stuff you can do prior. Now, that being said, I'm more than happy to see any patient that mm -hmm. gets in my clinic door and wants to see me and talk to me and we can go through all these things in that workup. And um, I think you know, when I tell people it's time to see an orthopedic surgeon is, in particular, if you've done a lot of these things, you've been dealing with this for, you know, a longer period of time, it's not getting better, it's getting worse, you've done some of the conservative stuff, you've done anti-inflammatories, you know, you've modified your activities, you may have had an injection, you've done some therapy, and it's not getting better, that's the time to come see us. Okay. And I think we have Arthur on the line with a question. Arthur, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay, what's your question? My question is, do you accept Medicaid? Do you accept Medicaid? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I know that's one of the things people ask, but I, I try to accept all walks of life in my clinic. Um, and so, again, I'm pretty open to taking people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the benefits of my position at Willis Knight and working for a big health system is it kind of affords me that, that ability to do that. That's wonderful news. Did, is that all you wanted to know, Arthur? Do you have another question? Okay, because I, on my my primary physical, uh, they tried to get this done. I, I got a rotary cut this shot, and she turned it in, my primary physical, for them to do other issues. Uh, I think there was an MRI or something to that effect, and Medicaid turned it down. So. 
Okay, so now you know you can probably go for some, yeah, for, to test it out and see what you can do. Yes, I will be making an appointment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for calling. Hope you get well soon. Thank you. That's really nice to know that yeah. there's all kinds of options for everyone watching. Yeah, just... I, I, I mean, I try to, you know, get people in that need help. You mm -hmm. know, I think, again, that's one of my philosophies is, um, you know, one of the reasons why I like Willis Knighton. It's a... Uh, They've helped me a lot with that and being able to see kind of everybody and not have to worry about, you know, where they're coming from and their, their stage in life. But basically treating everybody, you know, how I'd want my family members to be treated and giving yeah. them that opportunity to get access to that care, I think is important. Definitely very important. Yes, and I can see that. And definitely with Willis Knighton and mm -hmm. just making sure. And it's so amazing to be that open to help everyone who needs help and to have this kind of help here. Yeah. You don't have to drive to anywhere to Dallas or anywhere else or fly somewhere to get this. This is wonderful care right here, everything you would need yeah. and doing their best to make sure everyone gets it. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's our goal. Uh, that's our great, goal. so anyone calling, if you have more questions about there, anyone watching, call and ask about anything. If you have that stiffness or pain in your shoulder, have a question about it. Let's talk about initial treatment options mm -hmm. for the shoulder. Or let's talk about what happens. So they, they go to the doctor and they come to see you. Yeah. What happens at the first visit with Absolutely. an orthopedic surgeon? So anytime I see a patient, I mean, the first thing that I think is really important is one, to get to kind of a feel for the patient, you know, let me hear their symptoms in their own words. I see what they wrote down on the paper, but you know, different people internalize shoulder pain for different things. And you know, sometimes even if they're writing down, hey, it's only a three out of 10, that three out of 10 is again, keeping them from enjoying their time with their grandchildren, enjoying them for their hobby that they do on the weekends. And it's really good to kind of see what makes people tick and how this pain affects their life. And so we can kind of tr tailor treatment kind of according to that. So I'm always really important on fleshing out some of the history and the details from the patients. Um, secondarily, a thorough physical exam. I think any good surgeon is going to take you through that. You know, it's a very hands-on approach in my clinic. I want to make sure that, you know, even if from your history, a lot of times I already have a pretty good idea of what's going on. I want to confirm that. And I want to make sure when I'm doing a physical exam, I can show you these findings and how it correlates to your condition. Lastly, everybody essentially gets x-rays when they come in. You know, you know, there's obviously, you know, various pathologies we can pick up on x-ray, arthritis or otherwise, um, and it's good just to have a baseline of x-rays and I can kind of use that again when I'm explaining from my model, showing them on the x-rays as well, kind of what's going on in their condition. My goal being so that you thoroughly understand, you know, what is going on or what we feel is going on and kind of what our treatment options are. Um, you know, people wonder a lot of times, when are we gonna get an MRI or some more advanced imaging? If you come into my clinic and there's a certain things, you know, like having significant weakness on exam where I really do think you have a large rotator cuff, I'm going to be a little more aggressive to say, hey, this is probably worth our time to go get an MRI. We just need a little bit more information. If you've come back and we've done the initial, you know, conservative treatments we talked about, injections, anti-inflammatories, we've done physical therapy, and we're not improving or getting the progress that we're making, then that's another time when we say, hey, it's time to get, you know, the next step. Let's get a little more information. Let's get an MRI. And I think those are kind of the, the initial things you should think about and kind of the initial sequence when you come to see me. Okay. And so then it's decided that yes, you're going to need some surgery. Mm -hmm. um, does it depend on the specific surgery and the person? How long is the recovery from the shoulder? Yeah, that surgery? can vary broadly yeah. based on everything. I mean, even if you're thinking of something common like a rotator cuff mm -hmm. tear, you know, a rotator cuff is not a rotator cuff, it's not a rotator <laughs> cuff. You know, there's varying degrees of tearing. Um, you know, there's varying uh, uh, degrees of other associated pathology. You know, the rotator cuff is one common thing. Uh, another thing that's a cause of shoulder pain and they usually go hand in hand with my cuff patients is actually biceps. You know, in particular, you have several flexors of the upper arm. When people think of biceps, it's not just one tendon that's causing the whole elbow to flex. There's multiple muscles and flexors, and there's one in particular called the long head of the biceps, which is illustrated through here. It actually goes up, does a 90 degree turn, and attaches at the top of the socket. So you have a portion of that tendon inside the shoulder joint itself. And so, again, with rotator cuff, a lot of times you're going to have that bicep gets beat up, you know, and that also contributes to kind of the recovery and what we do in the surgery process. And so it, it's not a simple answer for that. I will say for most rotator cuff tears, if we have to repair things, it's at least six weeks in a sling. You're doing therapy right out the gate, though, just to keep you from getting stiff during that time. Then it's a gradual progression, and people say, Doc, what's the earliest I can possibly get back to doing everything? No restrictions. He cut me loose. <laughs> so the joke I always make with my patients is if you tell me you want to climb Mount Everest, you got to give me at least six months to get there. But sometimes it could take nine months, 12 months after a rotator cuff, realistically. When you're talking about 
other conditions, you know, I have a lot of patients in my practice that have uh, conditions that warrant shoulder replacement, either arthritis or otherwise. Um, that's usually a little quicker recovery than actually a rotator cuff, even though it's a bigger surgery and it's an open procedure versus the minimally invasive. Uh, it's one of those things where, again, you know, you're in a sling for a short period of time, I start progressing you, and the most important thing, I think, is knowing that everybody's going to be in therapy kind of right out the gate, and we're going to try to preserve that motion and, you know, get you back out of that sling, get you back moving, get you back to what you want to do when I feel it's safe enough and you know we're not going to re-injure ourselves. Okay and so there's surgery and then there's also replacement. When Absolutely. is it time for a shoulder replacement and Absolutely. what is all what happens there? What involves that? <laughs> so the rotator cuff again when we're doing most rotator cuff problems we're going to do them arthroscopically and that's a fancy way of saying we use little poke holes, special equipment, cameras. So we're working through these little minimally invasive oh. incisions around the shoulder. Shoulder replacement there's really two common causes um, and it's either going to be you get a very good amount of arthritis at the ball and socket. You know, we don't walk on our shoulders, so, you know, it's not as common as what you'd see in a knee or a hip, you know, and I think most people know about hip and knee replacements, but not necessarily shoulder replacement. But certainly, just like any other joint in the body, you can wear out that cartilage, you can basically lose that space, that can cause pain, stiffness, and we can certainly do shoulder replacement uh, in that situation. In other situations, I've had patients that get referred to me where they've had, you know, either one, two, several rotator cuff repairs, they've ultimately failed, or they tore their cuff a long time ago and they're basically to the point now where it's been such a long time the muscles have shriveled it's not a repairable thing there's some salvage options but in particular we have something called a reverse total shoulder where you actually put the ball where the socket is in the socket where the ball is and what that does and it's a very common procedure these days for people that have had these irreparable rotator cuff tears and what that does is it essentially keeps the shoulder in a good position so instead of having this ball if you imagine these tendons getting torn there's not going to be that stability factor you want in that shoulder. It's going to ride up, it's going to rub under this roof here. So by switching the ball with the socket, you can actually keep that shoulder in a better position and you change something called the center of rotation on the shoulder. So instead of needing that rotator cuff, you're relying on your overall deltoid or your shoulder muscle to power that shoulder. So the reason I like that procedure is because there are people in situations where you cannot fix a cuff or tear. And I will say for pain relief and even restoring function in some people that have very limited function due to a chronic rotator cuff tear, it's very good for both. And some of my happiest patients are my reverse total shoulder patients, surprisingly enough. <laughs> That's remarkable. Oh yeah, I want to hear more about that right now. We have Jason on the line. Jason, you have a question for the doctor? Yeah, on both my arms, right below my shoulder, uh, they're numb. And my uh, fingers get numb sometimes. So, so and, uh, you know, I try to uh, work out some push ups. And uh, I did one or two, and then one day I did five. But, you know, I used to do like 20 or 30, you know, and I'm like yeah. 46 now. And I had to lay down for a little bit and read a book. You know, while it's COVID nineteen's been going and everything, and, yeah, uh, and out of work and everything, and, uh, and I've kind of been just laying down and not moving around too much. But uh, I'm trying to get back in shape, but it, it, it's hard to do it. it now, is uh, numbness you're, you're saying is what your predominant symptom it don't is? Hurt, it's just numb. Yeah. So I will say numbness is also something that's pretty common complaint that I have, and that's not necessarily correlated to the shoulder. So, you know, I always tell patients, you're allowed to have two things going on at the same time. And I will say there's a lot of correlation between patients that come to see me with, you know, quote unquote, shoulder pain, and it's actually coming from the neck. So a lot of times with numbness, you know, there's either kind of two things. It's either coming from what we call central, and it may be coming from a pinched nerve in the neck, especially if you're getting it in bilateral or in both arms. All right, and that may be something to think about. You may be getting a little neck arthritis, you may have a little disc bulge, and certainly if you're getting numbness all the way down, especially into the fingers or the hands, that's something that I typically will do a neck x-ray and think about, do we need to focus on, do a little neck workup and get you referred to one of our neck guys. Um, that being said, you can also have, especially in guys that like to lift weights in particular, you can get peripheral kind of nerve compression. Most common for guys is going to be kind of at the elbows where you start getting ulnar nerve compression. It's called the cubital tunnel compression. And you'll get numbness typically in the fourth and fifth digits on your hand. And that's certainly something with exercise or sleeping. If you wake up and you get the numbness in those two fingers in particular, that's certainly something that could be going on. In addition, carpal tunnel, that's also something that can present itself with bilateral. So I think without a clinical exam, it's really kind of tough to flesh that out sometimes, but there's certainly a 
neck workup. There's a test called an electromyelogram, which is a way we measure nerve conduction velocity down the arms to see if there's compression. There's a lot of different things that we can do to kind of tease out where that, you know, the numbness symptoms that you're describing are coming from. Does that answer your question, Jason? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, uh, you know, because I have been laying down reading a good book, the Bible, and, uh, and uh, I have been laying on my neck, you know, laying down on the bed with my neck reading it. <laughs> and, you know, it's the first time I ever read the book. And, uh, yeah, I've been laying more more than than usual. So, yeah, I, I do understand that with the neck. Yeah, it certainly could be <laughs> it. And I will say, especially with bilateral symptoms, if you're having it in both arms, that very well may be the case. Yeah, it's both arms. Yeah, they're both. And it don't hurt, it's just dumb. Yeah. <laughs> well, certainly that'd be something if it's, yeah. if it's persistent, you know, that would be worthwhile, something to get worked up on, flesh it out a little bit more. Okay. All right. Appreciate that, Mr. Moore. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Good luck with okay. that. Thank you so much for calling. We appreciate it, and good luck to you. <laughs> and so the, the surgery replacement that you were just talking yeah. about, the reverse, the thing that you said is more common, that it yeah. really works well in people, that's really incredible. It is. I, I, I do like it. You know, it actually started over in Europe initially, oh. um, and over the past 20 years, I think it's gained a lot of popularity in the U.S. because. You know, traditionally we had those patients where when you get in a situation where you can't repair that cuff, that's a very painful, kind of an unstable shoulder, it starts getting arthritic, and it's a constellation of symptoms we call rotator cuff arthropathy. And that's a fancy way of saying that cuff is torn, you have instability in the shoulder, and you'll start riding up under the roof, you'll start getting arthritis at the ball and socket, and it's just kind of a miserable condition for a lot of people. Some people even come in, especially if this has been ongoing for a period of time, and they have what we call pseudoparalysis, which they're not paralyzed in that arm, but when you tell them to lift the arm they kind of shrug and they can maybe get it up to about here so they're limited in their function and they're hurting all the time so again it's a great option for those patients where traditionally we just say hey we can get you some injections there's a couple different salvage procedures but otherwise you got to kind of live with this and now I think you know the majority of the shoulder replacements I do are reverses for that condition um, I will also say with the shoulder replacement, a lot of people are always leery thinking, man, I don't want to stay in the hospital. You know, there's COVID, there's everything else. Right. If you're a candidate for it and you're an otherwise fairly healthy, active individual, I do a lot of these outpatient now. So even with the shoulder replacement, you don't even have to stay in the hospital per se. <laughs> and that's where I think with most of the shoulder surgeries that we do now, it's rare that we're keeping you inside, you know, the hospital is mostly done on an outpatient basis. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's another good point to talk about what we were talking about before. It's all right here for us, mm -hmm. this kind of care. Uh, and it's and never assume like things change every day we think we know that we're gonna have to be in the hospital and we assume everything go just go and make an appointment and yep. ask all the questions absolutely Spend all the time I'm sure you'd rather send someone home and say no it's just this we're gonna be good we're gonna take care of this but just absolutely ask. Just absolutely spend all the time and the good thing about the shoulder is you know when you come in ultimately I can make recommendations I can tell you what I think is going on you know we could look at your imaging do your exam but at the end of the day it's about you know it's mostly elective procedures elective being nobody can tell you you have to have anything done you know it's all about your quality of life you know what your symptoms are how much this is affecting you we can do as little or as much as you want to do so it's one of those things where you know again I think people get scared thinking that they're gonna come in and say hey sorry you don't have any options it's just surgery I'm happy to work with you in whatever capacity especially you know if you uh, are feeling that you can live with this and it's not something that's really affecting you that much we'll do different things to kind of work around that that's right you're there to just offer all the options that can be done Absolutely. that someone might not know and it's good to, to remind people too they go to their doctor they've done everything answered all the questions then they come see you mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it's going right to surgery no. you're going to start all again with these questions Absolutely. and once again to back what we started at the top or the last thing you want to put someone through a surgery if you can help it absolutely yeah yeah so good to know. So good to know that we have all of this right here. Mm -hmm. and, and and thank you for sharing how it can be a, a it can be you know a symptom from something else that's going on in yeah. your body, not necessarily an injury. And it's really, I'm sure you've seen some people just really debilitating. No one knows until it's happened how limiting and how oh yeah how it just really affects your life to not be able to have full range. And that's one of the toughest things with shoulder pain is you know you use your shoulder for everything. Right. You don't realize it until you have shoulder pain that you know every single aspect of life, taking care of yourself functioning on a day-to-day -day basis, you're constantly moving it. And that's also why when people start developing shoulder pain, it's so hard to kind of get rid of it sometimes because, you know, you can't walk around in a sling all day. You know, you got to use it. You got to live life, especially if your job requires it. Right. 
Well, thank you so much for being here, Doctor. We really Absolutely. appreciate it. This My has pleasure. been fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much for our viewers that called in with great questions yeah. and all the explanations. I've learned so much. So hey, appreciate thank you. It. We look forward to talking to you thank again you for sometime. Having me. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us today with Healthline 3. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care.